Automax Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome to our highlight show. With Germany now through to the semi-finals in Euro 2012, we have a football-focused show for you today. But here is what else is coming up. Larger Than Life, Versailles hosts sculpture with a feminist subtext. Soccer City, what to see and do in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. And Heads Up, Haute Couture Hats by Claudia Kusher. But first, the Palace of Versailles near the French capital Paris has long been known as both a former royal residence and a magnificent example of 17th century architecture. Each year since 2008, an internationally renowned contemporary artist has been invited to present his or her work in the palace grounds. For 2012, one of Portugal's most successful young female artists has been given this opportunity. And we headed to Versailles to take a look. This gate leads to one of the world's most famous palaces, Versailles. And this summer, visitors will be greeted by two giant sculptures, a pair of candlesticks over nine meters tall, made out of champagne bottles. Inside, there's another surprise, this oversized quilted monster. These red and black hearts made of plastic knives and forks were inspired by traditional Portuguese jewelry. They were created by Portuguese artist Joana Vasconcelos. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for an artist to express herself in a location like this, visited by thousands of people from around the world. And it sets an example. There's room for many different cultures in Europe, and it's important for them to communicate. I enjoy being able to share my Portuguese culture with others. Fifteen sculptures by Vasconcelos are on display at the palace. Nine of them were created especially for Versailles in just 18 months. Exhibiting at Versailles is an enormous challenge and puts huge pressure on the artist. Artists have to understand the location and its size. Working here is quite different from working in a normal museum with white walls. Vasconcelos fuses the traditional and the modern in her work, often using everyday objects and old handicraft techniques. A pair of ceramic lobsters covered in crochet are meant to symbolize the lavish banquets once held at the palace. And the 19 hair pieces in the wig sculpture stand for the heirs to the throne who were born here. To me, Versailles is a place where, in a way, women were held captive. That's why I wanted to do an exhibition about women in Versailles. Gigantic stilettos made of saucepans dominate the famous Hall of Mirrors and serve as a commentary on gender roles. The shoes were made before the exhibit and a pair were sold at auction two years ago to a Turkish collector for nearly 600,000 euros. When viewing my work, there are two moments. At first, you see the piece, and then you grasp the message behind it. My stiletto sculpture is about the woman of today and her double role, the traditional housewife who's devoted to the family, as well as the modern woman who works, plays a role in society, and has a glamorous side. The centerpiece of the exhibition is a gold-plated helicopter encrusted with crystals and pink ostrich feathers. If Marie Antoinette were living in this palace today, she'd need a very special means of transportation. And I'm sure she'd listen to Lady Gaga. With this helicopter, I wanted to give expression to this modern spirit. Vasconcelos work brings new color to the 350 year old walls and this contrast triggers a range of reactions from the people who visit the palace. I like these sculptures. They come as something of a surprise but they fit in very well. I don't think they're out of place. I really would like to see how it was for real, uh, the original form and to see something like that. Mm. Maybe make, make lose all the effect, that, the reality that we want to see. 
On that point, the artist sees things differently. When the Palace of Versailles was still a residence, many artists worked for the royal court. You see that in the countless paintings and sculptures here. Artists are nothing new at Versailles. They're part of its tradition. So I don't understand why some people have a problem. To keep a place like this alive, it's important for artists to continue to explore and to work for Versailles. The contrast between old and new fits in well with Joana Vasconcelos' approach. Her exhibition at the Palace of Versailles runs through the end of September. Now, with Poland co-hosting Euro 2012, football fans have been flocking there to get as close as they can to the Games. The Polish city of Wrocław is home to an Olympic stadium, but there aren't actually any matches being played there. This stadium has been used by a local opera company to offer an alternative form of entertainment to the football fans. <laughs> performance of Giuseppe Verdi's opera, A Masked Ball, in Wrocław's Olympic Stadium. It's a monumental production to go with the Euro 2012 soccer championships. This is something new for a change, an opera in the stadium. I'm at the fan zone every day watching soccer. A little culture can't hurt. I didn't get tickets for the matches, but at least I got to come here. The set is fabulous. You have to see it. I live right in the fan zone. I desperately needed a break. We'd only been watching the soccer tournament, but we can see all the results here and not miss a thing. A few hours earlier, cast and crew were rushing to get ready. None of the Euro 2012 matches is being staged at Wrocław's Olympic Stadium. It was reserved for the city's mega opera extravaganza. The cast included more than 100 players. Bulgarian singer Radostina Nikolaeva has her own perspective on the vast setting. It's my first time when I'm uh, performing in the in the such a place like a stadium, for example. This it's for me is um, a little bit uh, ex so uh, big responsibility. There were only two performances of the masked ball: the day before and the day after the match between Poland and the Czech Republic. The dates were chosen for a reason. <laughs> The city is already full of soccer fans and we just wanted to offer them something besides sitting around in the fan zone and drinking beer. Wrocław's Central Market Square belongs to the soccer fans for the duration of Euro 2012. This is the fan zone in this city of 600,000. The municipal stadium was built especially for Euro 2012. This is where the matches are played. By contrast, the Olympic Stadium is now 85 years old, but no actual Olympic Games were ever held in it. However, with so many soccer fans in the audience, the historic structure is the ideal venue for an opera. The singers are also like uh, football uh, players. Uh, every time they have to be in shape and good form, in good health, in the in the conditions, uh, in um, to be uh, in I I mean um, concentrated. The Wrocław Opera is already planning another epic Verdi production for next year, when the municipal stadium opens its gates to the masses for Aida. And from Poland, we head to the other host country of Euro 2012, Ukraine. The country's capital, Kiev, is of course full of visitors at the moment, but there's a lot more to this city than just football. Our reporter met up with a local fashion designer who showed us some of the cultural, historical and beautiful highlights of this thriving metropolis. Kiev is perched majestically on the banks of the Dnieper River. As a historic center of Orthodox Christianity, it's full of old churches and monasteries. Kiev is more than a thousand years old, the capital of a young Ukraine. 
Fashion designer Oleg Skirda loves his hometown and he's thrilled that so many are discovering it through the European Soccer Championships. It's great. It's going to bring us another step closer to civilized Europe. The Europe 2012 will be the start of more big events here, concerts, conferences. It'll be wonderful. In the center of Kiev at the moment, it's all about soccer. Here, amid the Stalin-era architecture, lies the fan zone. It's the nerve center for fans from all over the world who have come for the tournament. It's my first time here and I'm very surprised, positively surprised. It's lovely here. It's uh, interesting to see the architecture. It's big, strong, strong buildings. Uh, reminds, can you imagine what it was like in the old days uh, when you look around at the buildings here? Yeah? Very nice churches. Very, that's, that's really cool. But you need to do some maintenance here and there, I think, because it's, it looks a bit old every now and then. But it's very nice. Set on a hill a couple of kilometers away is Kiev's famous Monastery of the Caves. Each year, the complex that features a unique Ukrainian Baroque cathedral attracts millions of visitors. It's one of the oldest Eastern Orthodox cathedrals in the world. It's on UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites and it's under constant restoration. The main street in Kiev's old town was restored ahead of Euro 2012. Cafes and street vendors now line one of the oldest roads in the city. Oleg Skirda comes here often. He gains inspiration here for his work. I'm so pleased for my country. Pleased that among all the cheap junk around these days, I can still find things like this that are enchanting and make me proud of my homeland Ukraine. Kiev's top museum for modern art is the Pinchuk Art Center, opened by businessman and philanthropist Viktor Pinchuk in 2006. Here he displays parts of his major collection along with works on loan. The museum is currently exhibiting works by British sculptor Anish Kapoor. And soccer doesn't get shortchanged either. At night, Kiev's club scene comes alive. Kiev is a bustling Eastern European metropolis with Russian heritage. And it has a bit of something for everyone. And from a Ukrainian fashion designer to one a lot nearer to home here in Germany. Claudia Kusher has been in business for two years now. And as you're about to see behind me, she specialises in hats. The perfect accessory for a wedding or a day at the races. Claudia's come up with many imaginative designs and she's already receiving top class reviews. As far as Claudia Kosher is concerned, you can leave your hat on. The 28-year-old from Weimar creates hats that really turn heads. She's decorating this tiny artwork by hand with about a thousand silk ribbons. It looks sweet on your head and has zero calories. This is the Belle de Paris. It's the centerpiece of the collection, a hand-embroidered Eiffel Tower with varnish and rhinestones. She makes more than 100 models a year, each a modern twist on fashions, from the roaring 20s to the fabulous 50s. It's very important to me that they are sumptuous and striking, but still simple enough to be worn every day. They're meant to underscore the wearer's personality, and they do. Claudia studied her craft at the German National Theatre in Weimar. She went on to work as a stylist for, among other things, music television channels. She brought out her first collection in 2008. I gave it a lot of consideration and looked into whether there was interest. I tested the waters in the industry. I got so much positive feedback, I just decided to take a risk and give it a try. 
She founded her label two years ago and named it Die Zwillingsnadeln, The Twin Needles. She brings out two new collections a year using luxurious materials like tulle, silk and guinea fowl or heron feathers. It's paid off. Her hats have been used in photo shoots for numerous fashion and bridal magazines. Belle de Paris even made it into German Vogue. Claudia often models her own hats, which cost between 100 and 700 euros a piece. And she has plans for the future. I'll keep going and make more matching accessories for my hats and perhaps get one or two into the best circles. I'd really like to see one of my hats worn at the Royal Ascot, at the famous race. Making a single hat takes up to four days' work. And she manages publicity and marketing herself, with a little support from friends and professionals. The young designer would love to break out into the international arena and took a first step in that direction with an appearance at a key fashion industry fair in Berlin. But for now, she wants to stay in Weimar. Weimar is a lovely place to work. I love it because it's very quiet. I like the park and it gives me the serenity I need to work, but I get my inspiration and input elsewhere. In addition to a shop in Weimar, Claudia Köcher's miracles of millinery can be bought in Paris and on the internet. Good news for her followers around the globe. Now, although Claudia was seen doing some stitching in that report, the art of embroidery is not generally practised amongst the younger generation these days. However, Estonian-born Evelyn Kazikov is doing all she can to change that. Her modern, creative approach to cross-stitching is very on-trend and has gained her international recognition in the world of design. These portraits and letters aren't printed on paper. They're made of thread and embroidered. The only colors used are cyan, magenta, yellow and black. The ones used for four-color printing. This embroidering technique was developed by graphic designer Evelyn Kazikov, an Estonian who works in London. The idea came to me that what if this um, can be turned tactile and what if you could actually see inside the structure of color. And um, I looked at um, the, the, the half-tone raster, how it's arranged, and um, I decided to use cross-stitch. Evelyn Kazikov makes every stitch by hand. It can take her two hours to complete a few words in postcard format. Larger portraits require several days. I didn't stitch as a child, and uh, it's all very recent for me. I started using craft only when I moved to London and I did my MA here. So then I started the first craft experiments. That was in 2006. Now Evelyn Kazikov starts out with the design on a computer. That provides her with the precision grid patterns she then embroiders. For her latest project, Evelyn Kazakov asked her friends to send her photos. She then converted them into patterns of crosses, squares and lines. Each color is done separately, a time-consuming process. Evelyn started out cross-stitching letters and later moved on to pictures. It's not purely artistic, expressive, uh, but it's not also only um, functional typography, as we know it, uh, the type should be legible, type should be um, uh, like communication device, good typography, invisible, but uh, my, in my work, uh, I think it sits somewhere in between. Evelyn has made a name for herself in art circles with her lettering. They've been featured in international design books and magazines. Among them, the New York Times magazine, the Guardian newspaper, and Wired magazine which has even used her technique as its signature style. But Evelyn Kazikov makes a clear distinction between her work and traditional handicrafts. 
it's a horrible thing to say, say that I'm not really interested in cross stitch, but the fact that um, I'm not much into cross stitch actually gives me the freedom to do whatever I want with it. The Wicca Agency specializes in handmade designer products. Evelyn Kazikov's agent is Laura Vent. Vent is putting the designer's work into the public spotlight with her postcard series Be Happy. It's inspired by the Twitter social network. It's a completely different um, attitude, I suppose, to, to using a kind of needle and a thread. It's, it's really super cool. It's, you know, no one else is doing anything like it. And she's kind of using all of the design background that she has and is just applying it to a really kind of a traditional technique. And But bringing that completely up to date is completely at the forefront of, like, cross-stitch. Although even the smallest work demands a lot of time, Evelyn dreams of stitching on a grander scale. I would, um, I would like to escape the small format. <laughs> I would like to do something... Uh, bigger scale and maybe work with architects or, you know, people from different disciplines. I would like to see that on the side of a building. Evelyn Kazikov's embroidered graphics are proof that handicrafts are anything but old fashioned. And we finished the show today with a group of happy football fans. German men are known for their enthusiasm when it comes to supporting their favourite team. And with the European Football Championships in full swing, this group of men from Munich have gone so far as to reenact the gestures of the games in public. Of course, it's all just light-hearted fun, but we thought we'd check out how well they actually fill the clichés. We've seen him countless times on the pitch. The soccer coach, frustrated with his team's performance as the final whistle approaches. Time to swap in a substitute. The players warming up here aren't real players. They're friends of Martin Emmerling, playing a supporting role in his soccer pantomime outside an ice cream parlor in Munich. I'd have liked to be a professional football player, but sadly it didn't work out. So becoming a coach is the only option left. I'm practicing on the street. Maybe one day I'll get my coaching certificate. It's fun telling people what they have to do. The idea of miming soccer stars came to Martin at a streetcar stop. He was soon back at the stop with his friends for their first performance, complete with stadium bench. It led to a web series called Vorsicht Fußball, or Watch Out, Soccer. A building site becomes a penalty area, and here a local train turns into a dressing room. Martin Emmerling lives in Munich's Heidhausen district. He meticulously practices the moves in his apartment. The 31-year-old has picked up a lot from watching soccer every weekend since childhood. He earns his living as a sports journalist. Martin seems familiar with the gestures of all the star coaches, including Germany squad coach Joachim Löw. Both hands in his trouser pockets, sitting unconventionally on the advertising banners like he did a couple of years ago. Otherwise, he's very casual on the sidelines. Martin has also performed Vorsicht Fußball in Munich's subway. The strict rules of the series are no balls, soccer shirts or whistles. The set can't be touched. What makes it so much fun is performing out in the open, breaking outside the box and getting strange looks. That motivates me. Doing it in a studio would take away the charm and wouldn't work. 
dressing up is allowed as long as it has nothing to do with soccer. Martin is brimming with ideas and now wants to play at being a linesman. In the middle of city traffic. And that brings us to the end of another edition of Euromax Highlights. Thanks for watching, everyone. And until next time, take care and goodbye.